Are we good to go? We are good to go. Okay. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. It's good to see everybody. And uh, I am glad you're here today. Um, what we're going to be covering is a wonderful parasha that is going to be very enlightening for us all. And so we're doing Vyashev today. And as we think about Vyashev, and you look at the text of the parasha, it's really not a lot about Jacob. It is a lot about Joseph, which we're going to cover. And it is also going to be about uh, our Lord uh, through the prophet Zechariah. And we're also going to be covering, going to the Brit Hadashah. And we're also going to be looking at some verses from John 10. So having said that as an introduction, uh, let me just pose a question or two for you to think about today. Uh, looking at your life and the life that you're living right now, I ask you these questions. Are you facing a difficult decision right now in your life? Are you dealing with some difficult matters? Maybe things that you have prayed about to God and asked for some answers, but you have no answers that are really forthcoming right now. But praise God for the faith that you have, for the things that you really have on your heart or your hearts. I want you to know God cares, but we're going to see an illustration of this today in the parasha and how it applies to one particular person. And that person I'm talking about, everybody, is Joseph. We're going to get an idea of what it was for him to have faith in the midst of a very dire situation. So let's talk a little bit about Joseph. So Joseph was Jacob's son, and he came from the marriage, his marriage with Rachel. He was the firstborn from that marriage. And the name Joseph is an, is an interesting thing. It means to add or increase, which is something that Pastor Joe is always looking for as far as his congregation goes. Is, yeah, I think you might agree with that. But aside from that, uh, I want to point out that Joseph's life was not exactly a life where his older brothers were really happy with this guy. And I don't think you would be either, because imagine if you were working on a, on a job and you had the boss's son that was constantly coming over to check on you. Uh, you get a little irritated after a while, and so did his brothers. Uh, Joseph also was a dreamer, and he had great dreams of glory where people were bowing down to him, and uh, he would share his dreams, and uh, people had a problem with it. He seemed pretty arrogant, but yet Father Jacob was always extremely kind to him, and the favoritism grated on his brothers, as many of you know who know the story. And so this became too much for them. So what did they decide to do? Well, one day when Joseph was taking a visit out to see him, well, I should change that and say spy on him, spy on them. Uh, what happened was, is they tossed him in a pit. And uh, it looked like that was it for Joseph. But it turns out that there were some Midianite traders coming along and they rescued him out of the hole. And they decided to take him to Egypt, where he would be under a guard a Praetorian, well, <laughs> he would be under a, a uh, pharaoh uh, later to be, but this was a captain of the guard, and this was a guy named Potiphar. And Potiphar eventually found him to be useful as a slave. Uh, and it turned out everything was looking bright and rosy for Joseph. He was serving Potiphar. Everything seemed to be going great for him uh, up until a point. And as for those of you who know the story, uh, Joseph was a very godly man, and uh, of course, God was keeping track of him, even, even where he was. It, it, Joseph had to be wondering what kind of a life he was going to be living here uh, with the rest, uh, with, his, with his father and his brothers in Egypt, and here he was serving this, um, this Egyptian captain and wondering what his life was going to be like. Well, he didn't have to wait too long. Joseph was doing a great job. He was very organized, very smart, and he was also very, very handsome, as says the scriptures. And it caught the eyes of Mrs. Potiphar. And what did she want? Well, she propositioned him, not once, not twice, but a lot. And poor Joseph, day after day, had to say, um, thanks for the compliment, ma'am, but I'm sorry, uh, I'm not doing this. And he would walk away. 
Well, persistent woman that Mrs. Potiphar was, she continued propositioning him until one day when there was no one else around except Mrs. Potiphar and Joseph, she propositioned him again. And it turns out that um, he tried to tell her, you know, this is wrong. We're not doing this. Uh, she didn't care. And so she advanced on him and he basically said, I'm out of here. And he tried to leave and he did, but he left something behind. And um, that uh, part of his clothing that he left behind would be used to implicate him in a false crime. He was charged with trying to seduce and possibly even maybe rape Mrs. Potiphar. She made a false claim about Joseph because we know it's not true. And he was blamed for that. And uh, so when Mr. Potiphar came home and spoke to his wife, she told this false story, made these false accusations. And what happened to poor Joseph? Well, uh, Potiphar threw him in prison and it looked like that's where he was gonna spend the rest of his life rotting away. Um, but think about this for a moment. One of the amazing things about Joseph, which was very interesting is he was a very organized guy, very, very organized. And in that organization, while he was there, I wonder what his faith was like when he was under this difficult time. And that kind of brings us to us, just to take a side note here for us to think about. So look at your life for a moment. Are you struggling with something? Are you having a difficult time making the ends meet? Or perhaps you're having a difficult time trying to figure out how you're going to resolve that medical problem. And you're wondering, I prayed, I, I, I'm not really getting any answers from God. But again, imagine poor Joseph, as we look on his life, here he was in prison for something he didn't do. And again, you are living your life before God. You're, you're being as holy as you can. You're, you're loving God. You're praying to God. You're saying the prayers. You're doing everything that you know is right. And yet your life is not right. And you're thinking, what am I doing wrong here? And so what are you doing? You're, you're persisting in prevailing prayer. And I truly believe in prevailing prayer. And I hope you do too, because it's the importance of going back to God even in the midst of a dire situation. And of course, if, if, we, if, we, if we fast forward to the New Testament, we know that Paul was locked up in prison with Silas and they sang songs and they witnessed to the guard and they, <laughs> they won the guard to Christ. They made a most of a bad situation and God used that. And the same with Peter. Peter was also in prison. And again, an angel let him out. So God knows where you're at right now. He's hearing your prayers. He knows you're going through a difficult situation and he cares. He really cares about you. And he wants to let you know that he is working things out according to his time. And which is something I have to remember because I have an idea when God is supposed to act. And I'm sure he looks at me and says, Brian, that's not exactly how I'm gonna work this out. Uh, I'll work this out the way I want to work it out when I'm ready to work this out in your life. And I've learned that lesson over and over again. Maybe some of you have too. But this is important for us to remember because this is the God we serve. We serve a God who is infinitely wise and knows what's best for our lives more so than we do. Well, let's continue our story about Joseph because uh, what we had going on, well, we're going we're gonna to stop at this point because I want to take a little bit of a detour. Uh, as I was reading through the scriptures on this, I thought to myself, you know, this reminds me a little bit of a soap opera. Because when you watch a soap opera, you're, you're following the characters and all of a sudden they switch to a completely different scene. And, and, and if you haven't been following the soap opera, you have no idea what's going on. But actually, what happens here is very, very interesting because God introduces the story of Judah and Tamar. Uh, Judah, uh, you remember, was one of the 12 sons of Jacob. And it turns out that at this point in time, he's married and he's got three sons. Um, he's got a, a son by the name of Er. He's got a son by the name of Onan and a son by the name of Shelah. And this is a really interesting story. Uh, what happens here is that there is a woman by the name of Tamar who marries uh, uh Judah's oldest son, uh, his name was Er, and it turned out that he was a very, very wicked man, and 
uh, so God took his life because of that wickedness. He made an error. And so it turns out that from there, we have uh, the next obligation uh, in Onan, who was supposed to, to marry Tamar. He didn't want to do it. He, he kind of reneged on his family obligation. So God took his life. And then we had Shalah, Shala, which was the third son. And uh, Judah said, wait a minute here. I don't want to lose my third son. This doesn't make sense. And he was really young. So he made an excuse to Tamar and said, hey, I'd give you my third son, but he's just really young. Let him grow up a little bit. Once he grows up, hey, you can have him. We'll work out a deal. And uh, so Tamar kind of knew she was being taken. So what did she do? Uh, she decided to become a prostitute along the way. And she propositioned, so to speak, a Judah. Uh, they had relations. And uh, it turns out that uh, he tried to get back. He made a pledge to Tamar uh, that uh, he would, you know, remember her. And, um, and so uh, he had an obligation to her. And that obligation resulted in his being discovered. It turns out that uh, Tamar actually revealed who, who she was. Uh, they had, she had uh, two boys. One was Perez, which was in the Messianic line. And it turns out that Judah was publicly embarrassed for what he did. But the point we want to take away from this is that uh, out of that arrangement, uh, out of with a woman posing as a prostitute, uh, it turns out that we had a continuation of the messianic line, uh, which would eventually lead um, to um, uh, the, um, uh, I think there was one that came after um, uh, Perez, and then, that, and then um, it turns out, I'm trying to remember, uh, Boaz, and then uh, Anyway, the, the story is, is that a little further on down the line, there's actually going to be, um, it, well, we got to back up a little bit to go to some hit, history, which I find very interesting. Uh, but that was the fact that uh, God has used a prostitute in, in the Messianic line. He uses all kinds of people <laughs> in order to work out arrangements uh, to continue the Messianic line. Uh, he just looks for the heart. God works with the heart. And that's that's the thing we want to recall there. All right. So now the soap, all soap opera continues with Joseph. Uh, God switches us back to Joseph. Um, and here, Joseph deals with the dreams of two prisoners. So one is a butler and the other is a baker. They both have some really bad dreams. Joseph, uh, at this point in time, uh, goes ahead and explains what the dreams are. And uh, they're pretty interesting dreams. But the point of the matter is, as Joseph interprets the dreams, in one case, the man after his, the, who had this dream, um, which um, uh, now I'm trying to keep these two guys straight. Um, it turns out, I believe it was the butler. I could be wrong. I want to say it's the butler uh, who has a dream indicating that he would go before Pharaoh and um, because he didn't do something right in the preparation uh, or his work as a steward, uh, he, um, he went ahead and lost his life. Uh, it turns out that the baker um, was the one that uh, survived. And if I'm wrong, Joe, correct me here, but um, I do believe it would have been, uh, that's how it had it resulted there. Anyway, long story short, one of the guys lost his life, but here's the important lesson we want to take away. Joseph was faithful. Joseph was faithful. He was faithful in interpreting the dreams, and word got out that there's a guy in the prison who can interpret dreams. Well, what happened was, is that Pharaoh was having some really bad dreams, and eventually, uh, they somebody said, "Hey, you got to check in with this guy Joseph, a prisoner, who um, who really knows how to interpret dreams." And that was all Pharaoh needed. He needed to have somebody tell him about his nightmares. That's eventually what Joseph did. So. We're gonna we're gonna stop there because that's kind of where the parasha breaks off, and we're gonna shift to the Haftarah, which is Zechariah, two verses, uh, uh, fourteen through four seven, and basically what we have there is a preview. Zechariah is giving us a, a preview of Yeshua. Uh, he does it through prophetic words. Uh, it does take a little work to kind of understand that, but it is, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. What I'd like to do is let you know that we do have Messiah that is prophesied in Zechariah 
um, 2, 14 through 4, 7. So uh, this moves us on to the New Testament and John 22 through 28. And what perfect timing in the parasha here, because it has to do with Hanukkah or the Feast of Dedication. And as some of you might remember, if you've read John 10, uh, that's when Yeshua was walking with his disciples in and around the temple. And so again, this was very, very interesting because back in John 8, 12, Yeshua told his disciples that he was the light of the world. And what's very, very interesting, people, is that uh, again, as you get to the temple, there was this enormous menorah that was set in a position so that it could be seen from all Jerusalem. It was huge. And that menorah, amazingly enough, was called the light of the world. And so what, what a perfect way for Yeshua to make a great impression on his disciples. But by the same token, uh, he was also there to witness to the Pharisees, which is what he did. And in the, he declared again, I am the Messiah, but you don't know me like my disciples do. You don't know, my, know me like my sheep. And so you don't get this. And so I want to finish up today with some words from Dr. David Jeremiah. Um, some of you may have Christmas trees, some of you may not, but I'd like you to just reflect on something that I found very interesting in a devotional from Dr. Jeremiah. So I'd like to leave you with this. Christmas trees have always displayed lights. Why? Originally, the lights were to illuminate dark houses in the dead of winter and were a welcome source of cheer. But for believers, the reason was obvious, to celebrate the birth of Yeshua, who came as the light of the world, John chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. As Simeon declared when seeing the infant Jesus, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. So for us, let us be the light of Yeshua in our world as we celebrate Christmas this year and Hanukkah, uh, his light dispels all darkness when it shines forth. Praise the Lord. That's the parasha for today, everybody. Thank you.